Good evening, and uh, can I start off just by apologising for the late start. I've always taken the view that um, a chair only has two tasks, to start on time and finish on time. Um, I failed in the first, and it wasn't entirely my fault. I mean, it's Sheffield and rallies, isn't it? Um, so, uh, so here we are. Um, when I was telephoned by Charles Kennedy in 1999, and he asked if I would be interested in going to the Lords. He said, well, of course, the new government are absolutely committed to Lords reform, so you won't be there for very long. <laughs> um, I'm, of course, now into my 11th year, uh, and the discussion still raised, and so uh, it's interesting to have, um, you know, perhaps a looking back as well as a looking forward and a looking at, at where we are now. And uh, I find myself in the odd position now of being able to welcome two noble friends. Um, I have to say, the relationships between the two coalition partners in the Lords, um, some of them are extremely cordial. There are other noble Lords who, when they say noble friend and refer to Liberal Democrats, it definitely sticks in their throat. Um, but, um, uh, but our guest this evening is not one of those. I think we work extremely well together. I know we listen very carefully to what you have to say. So the two guests, um, of course, are Lord Norton of Louth. Um, Philip is a renowned constitutionalist, and we're very, very pleased <coughs> that you've come to talk to us this evening. Um, and my other noble friend is a new noble friend, Jonathan Marks, Lord Marks. You're very welcome indeed, and standing in the course for Paul Tyler, which I know you'll do very well indeed, so thank you. For that. So, um, usual format, I think, about 15 minutes each from the speakers, uh, and then an opportunity for, for questions. Uh, Philip, could I ask you to start? Right, thank, thank you, you very much. Now, when we uh, have the coalition, I decided what to call one, and then one of my colleagues wants to call, refer to my neighbour acquaintance. Yes. <laughs> 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 and I did think of referring to Lord McNally first time as my, uh, my new best friend. Yeah. <laughs> But um, anyway, what I've been asked to do is, is provide some of the historical background to where we are now. In terms of where we are, I gave a lecture at the Stevenson Lecture in Glasgow, the University of Glasgow, uh, in January. So I've actually brought copies of uh, the lecture, so I'll distribute those. So you're, you're welcome to uh, have that. So it allows me just to focus on the history. Um, so freedom of time could be equivalent to the, the 20th century in, in terms of changes to... Uh, the second chamber. So the primary focus is the Parliament Act, um, 1911. Now, if one looks at its origins, there was a, the rejection by the House of Lords of the 1909 budget. So that was the peg on which the Act it, it was, was hanged. But to understand the 1909 you've got to go back much further, and you, you can keep going back historically. But I think the the main events to bear in mind. I think, are uh, Pitt the Younger, because it really dates from his premiership that um, the House was acquired a Tory majority. So it wasn't just the hereditary principle, it was the political balance, uh, and that dates from the early 19th century when Pitt created a large number of new peers. But in terms of the uh, uh, specific event, um, it's really, I think, the 1867 reform. You can see the trend already, the pressure as a result of the 1832 reform. But it wasn't on such a scale, really, to call into question the relationship between the two houses. But once you had change on the scale of that of the 1867 Act, it did. And during the passage of the, the 1867 Bill, I actually read the debates, and there's a very prophetic uh, statement by the Earl of Shaftesbury. And I'll just quote it, because I think it does provide the, the context, because he said, when we come to look at a house in which I now have the honour to address your lordships, I ask how it will be affected by this great democratic change. So long as the other House of Parliament was elected upon a restricted principle, I can understand that it would submit to a check from a House such as this. But in the presence of this great democratic power and the advance of this great democratic way, it passes my comprehension to understand how a registry House like this can hold its own. It might be possible for this House in one instance to withstand the measure of it were violent and just and coercive, but I do not believe that repetition of such an offence would be permitted. It would be said, the people must govern, and not a set of hereditary peers never chosen by the people. So in a way, you've already got that pressure there, that recognition that the uh, hereditary house, and one that was Tory dominated, would have difficulty maintaining the claim to be co-equal with a chamber elected uh, by a popular mandate. 
So that was the essential background. And pressure for change um, really built up after that, not least when you had a Liberal government, uh, a Conservative House of Lords kept rejecting measures, and so you had the Liberal demand of mend or end, which became part of the 1891 uh, Newcastle programme. So you already had pressure there before the Liberals won a massive uh, landslide victory in 1906. So they were already thinking about Lord's reform then. There was a cabinet committee set up in 1907, and what it decided um, and, and what it brought before the Commons to resolve was basically that the representative of the people should be able to have their way. So you've already got that pressure. So the 1909 budget wasn't the cause of the act. It was the trigger that led to yeah. <clears throat> the change that was probably going to happen anyway. So that was the background to the act itself, bringing forward the measure by the government, which was already contemplating uh, Lord's uh, reform. Now, in terms of the bill itself, um, <coughs> we tend to adopt you know, the interpretation of history and assume this is what would have happened anyway. Um, but it was by no means certain that the reform would take the form it did. The, there was a, an intense discussion within Cabinet between what was known as the Ripon Plan and the suspensory veto. And for a while, if they go for the Ripon Plan, the, the argument there was that if there was a dispute between the two houses, it should be resolved by a conference of the two chambers. All MPs plus a, a fixed number of peers, um, much smaller number, so the Commons would have got its way. But it would have been, if you like, a um, conciliation committee, a conference committee, to resolve the issue. Uh, and and Asquith uh, uh, favoured that, but didn't uh, uh, push it. Um, so the other one was the suspension veto. In other words, the law should be restricted to um, being able to veto a measure, but only for a limited period. Uh, and that was what eventually went into the bill. But after considerable discussions, it was finally being so that would be um, the provision. And also, of course, there was the difficulty then of getting it through, um, through the, the, the Lords. Um, so the bill was introduced, providing for a uh, suspensory veto. The Lords could um, veto uh, a non-money bill for two successive sessions. Uh, and, but a, a money bill would go through a month after um, being sent from uh, the Commons. Uh, and the basic provisions there uh, were enacted, but only after um, being able to use uh, the threat of creating semi liberal peers as to ensure its passage uh, in the Lords. A lot of politics surrounding it, not just with the Conservatives, um, and obviously it's complicated by the death of the King, and the two 1910 general elections, which did not provide the overwhelming majority of the Liberals um, to get the measure through. To get it through, they required the Nationalists, uh, and that in a way ensured they did get it through, um, but they had to, uh, the Liberals had to offer it to the Nationalists to make sure um, it went through, because the Nationalists were far more determined to get laws reformed than the Liberals actually were. Um, but the government was dependent upon the Liberals for passage of the budget, and the Nationalists would only support the budget if they got Lord's reform, because for the Nationalists, Lord's reform was essential to get home rule. So that was the politics of it. Um, the new king, probably his father, in accepting that if necessary, he would create enough peers to get the measure through. So once Asquith uh, made that clear to the Conservatives, then um, they, not all, but a sufficient number of the Lords were prepared to let it through. So the 1911 Act was uh, enacted. And so that's been the fundamental measure uh, affecting the relationship between the two uh, 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 chambers. Um, and there are two points worth bearing in mind, particularly in terms of the contemporary debate about the passage. Because mm. um, uh, Edward Gray was very keen on actually reforming composition. The cabinet were against that um, because they recognised if it did that, that would actually strengthen the position of the, the second chamber. They didn't want that. So they were not going to change the composition. It was to restrict the powers of an hereditary chamber. That was the, the, the key, one of the key points. And the other point is, it was quite explicit in terms of motion. <laughs> it was to assert the supremacy of the elected house in relation to an elected uh, second chamber. Um, so the changes that took place in the first half of the 20th century were to limit the powers of the second chamber. The change of the latter half, focusing on composition, enhanced its legitimacy. So in the first half, you've got the 1911 Act, 
then subsequently the 1949 Act to ensure the passage, the government got the it, it, it steel bill. Um, not because the Lords themselves had been using their powers excessively, only two measures um, were actually passed both in 1914 under the provisions of the 1911 Act until the 1949 Act. So there are only three uh, Acts uh, passed under the provisions of the 1911 Act, and, and since of course just four under the provisions of the 1949 Act. So the first half of the 20th century um, devoted to reform of the powers of the House, but in the second half, um, focusing on composition. Because uh, uh, the pressure for reform within government, and one thing that's worth stressing is that until the 1911 Act, uh, the calls for reform, uh, pressure for reform, was seen as coming from within the House. It wasn't seen as the role of government. It's only after the 1911 Act was passed that it was seen as the role of government come forward with proposals for reform. Um, so within government, it was actually a Conservative who was pressing for it. This is where the, the real pressure came from. Um, uh, Lord Salisbury, poverty, um, was the one who was very keen on reform. He really kept pushing it uh, and was largely responsible for um, the pressure leading to the Life Peerages Act in 1958, um, which was opposed by Labour because um, they recognised it might strengthen the House. Um, so they were opposed to it. But uh, 1958 Life Peerages Act enabled peerages to be conferred for life, so it meant that people could be brought in who otherwise would object to the principles of uh, hereditary uh, peerage. So it broadened the membership, and of course it was the act that allowed uh, women peers uh, to sit. So that was the introduction of uh, women life peers. 1963 Peerages Act allowed uh, peers to disclaim following pressure from uh, uh, well, the person now known as Tony Benn, but then was the right honourable mm -hmm. Anthony Needle, which would bend the second black hand stands game. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but of course had uh, other consequences to the Conservative Party, which, uh, uh, well, certain of them, uh, thought was quite beneficial, uh, not least the other few. Um, so, the 63 Act, but then the other big act, I mean, the, the really significant ones in terms of the House of Lords, 1958 Life Peerages Act, and of course the 1999 uh, House of Lords Act which removed uh, the hereditary basis, the principle for membership, but as a compromise to get the bill through, allowing 92 hereditary peers to remain in uh, the House. Um, we'll probably come on to the, you know, what's been since and the, the, the pressure to change, but those are the acts that uh, on the um, statute book, and I'd say the 58 Act and the 99 Act, in effect, um, um, enhanced the legitimacy of the Second Chamber. Prior to 1958, not very active, very low attendance, um, problems with the, the, the party uh, composition. So it didn't sit very long in the day, didn't sit uh, that many days, poor attendance. Um, and of course, during the war, after the Commons was bombed, the Lords moved to the Raving Room, which was sufficiently large to uh, accommodate the House. So suddenly it was dying on its feet. So the 58 Act allowed the, the House to be revitalised. The life peers became disproportionately active members of the House. Um, and of course allowed for some political rebalancing. And then that was enhanced by the 1999 Act, because the House was, because a combination of two acts transformed the Second Chamber from a overwhelmingly uh, hereditary um, Tory-dominated House to an overwhelmingly uh, House based on life membership with no one party enjoying the majority. So quite a fundamental transformation. And the 99 Act, as the research of Meg Russell has shown, tended to enhance the uh, authority of the House and a willingness to use its powers on the grounds it had a legitimacy to do so in a way that the House previously did not. So that's a quick canter through um, the, the legislative history, just to put it into context uh, as to where we are. And I think I've kept to my 15 minutes. That is the mark of a true professional. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> To, uh, to cover it so comprehensively in such a short time. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, over to you. Yes, well, what I propose to do is to look at where we are now and um, cast around some ideas as to where I think we may be going, uh, where others think we may be going, to open the discussion. Um, because al although we have a fairly clear commitment uh, to reform the House of Lords, which is also involved in the fellowship agreement, uh, there are divergent views, and um, nowhere are those views uh, more strongly held, I think, than in the House of Lords, and more divergently held than in the House of Lords. It's um, important to note 
that uh, the 1911 Act, which, um, uh, about which we've heard, uh, carried a preamble mm. uh, that said, and whereas it is intended to substitute for the House of Lords as it presently exists, a second chamber constituted on a popular instead of hereditary basis, but such substitution cannot be immediately brought into operation. <laughs> <laughs> and whereas provision will require hereafter to be made by Parliament in a measure affecting sub such substitution for limiting and defining the powers of the new second chamber, but it is expedient to make such provision as in this act appears for restricting the existing powers of the House of Lords. So the 1911 Act was seen as a temporary stopgap uh, there was going to be a popular based House of Lords, but the powers of the House of Lords were necessary to be um, limited at that stage. Well, the limits on the powers, as um, Philip has explained, have um, uh, developed, over the, developed over the first part of the 20th century, uh, but the composition has been sporadically changed, changed um, dramatically, um, as Philip explained, by the Life Peerages Act. But we still have, as a result of um, the negotiating power of Viscount Cranbourne, 92 hereditary pairs in the house, um, sitting there by reason of their birth alone and um, the fact that they got elected by other hereditaries, um, largely from within their own parties. But it's worth remembering that we have a by-election involving the whole house um, at the, the end of this month. Uh, because of the death of Lord Strabogi, who um, was a deputy speaker, as a result of which we are all going to vote for a replacement hereditary peer, <laughs> which <laughs> some may think is a slightly um, odd uh, position. Uh, it is uh, that much more interesting that we're going to vote, of course, by AV. <laughs> <laughs> And nobody has suggested that we should vote by first past the post, in spite of the fact that there are um, vociferous advocates of first past the post for uh, certain other elections within the House of Lords <laughs> and elsewhere. At any rate, that's the position where we are. It's also uh, interesting that um, I even since the 1999 <coughs> um, Act, when the bulk of the hereditaries left, uh, we have had very little agreement on the shape of the House of Lords. And I'm going to concentrate on composition uh, in what I say, and um, uh, also methods of election and so forth, because I think that it is going to be the case that we are going to have to revisit the question of powers. Uh, in particular, it seems to me that it is likely that we'll have to look at how long bills can remain in the House of Lords under consideration, as well as what the powers are to delay. Uh, but it seems to me that it would be better to look at that after we have determined the question of composition and let uh, a new House of Lords uh, settle down a bit. Uh, but the fact is that even though we had a Labour government with an overwhelming majority um, from 1997, uh, they achieved the 1999 Act, that was supposed to be temporary only. That in 2004, um, Lord Falconer effectively signalled the abandonment um, of uh, further attempts to uh, legislate for the composition. Uh, that there was that uh, dramatic vote in March 2007, uh, when both proposals for 100% and 80% uh, secured majorities. Uh, we have all parties uh, having entered the last election with a manifesto commitment to reform. And we have a coalition agreement which um, commits the government to reform. Uh, and yet we don't have certainty that we're going to achieve it. But um, I'm a committed reformer, uh, and I hope we will, and we might look at the, the, what's likely to happen. To remind ourselves, the coalition agreement um, uh, stated that we would establish a committee to bring forward proposals for a wholly or mainly elected upper chamber on the basis of proportional representation. The committee will come forward with a draft motion by December 2010. It's likely that this will advocate single long terms of office. It's also likely that there will be a grandfathering system for current peers. 
uh, and then have dealt with um, entering appointments. Well, we've passed December 2010. Uh, there is going to be um, a draft bill reasonably soon, uh, likely to be in the late spring now because the president's going it forward before the local elections are likely to have been caught up by the Perdic division during the local election campaign. Uh, so in the late spring, we will get a set of proposals. Those will then go to a joint committee for um, pre-legislative scrutiny, and it's likely that that will take about a year. Um, my uh, view is that we are probably best to have options at every stage on the basis that reform is more likely to be achieved if people are concentrating on various possibilities for reform than on the simple question of uh, yes or no to a set of proposals which they can then say they don't like. But we'll see what form the draft bill takes and we'll see what form uh, the draft bill is when it comes out or the recommendations of the committee uh, at the end of the pre-legislative period. So the first area for discussion is undoubtedly going to be 80-20 or 100%. Now, what's been interesting in Philip's presentation, and underlining it, is that he's talked about the um, changes of powers as being directed to the question as to whether the two chambers were co-equal because of the importance of keeping the supremacy of the House of Commons. Uh, and reformers on composition entirely agree, almost, I think, to, um, to a person, that the House of Commons ought to have supremacy as the elected House that's elected on a constituency basis uh, and is effectively the House of the majority, of the vast majority of the government. But there is a danger that putting forward an elected second chamber will slightly change that balance. Now, I'm personally committed to 100% elected, and I believe that's a matter of principle that in a democracy our legislators should be elected. But there are those that argue for part be elected, part be appointed on the basis that that doesn't, um, or it makes it more likely that we will preserve uh, the supremacy of the House of Commons. If 80-20, which I suppose is the most likely um, set of proportions for uh, elected uh, as against appointed peers, uh, I feel very strongly, and I think most reformers feel very strongly, that the political peers ought to be elected, and that it's wrong to preserve for the political peers uh, a power of appointment. If you're going to stand for political office, you should, uh, you should be elected. Which would allow the, the 20% to be cross-benchers, um, the people's peers have been, in spite of the fact that the people thrown off by the people's peer system, have not been unlikely candidates for peerages in any event, because they tend to have been the, the great and the good, um, as broadly stated. Nevertheless, the people's peers has been a, a popular innovation, uh, and they've sat uh, on the cross benches. So, for instance, David Panic, who's um, sympathetic to uh, the Liberal Democrats, uh, and indeed was a member of the Liberal Democrat lawyers for a long time, uh, took a, a people's peerage, accepted appointment, became a crossbencher, and of course now argues against us whenever he feels like it, notwithstanding <laughs> that his principles are still, uh, are still close, close to us. Uh, and of course there's um, the question of the Lord's um, spiritual, because we've had um, a valuable contribution from the bishops over the years. Uh, more recently, the chief rabbi has been uh, a member, and I think there's a very strong feeling that other faith leaders uh, ought to have a place in any appointed element in the House of Lords. So if we were going to have the 20% appointment, my feeling would be that it would have to be cross-benchers, faith leaders, possibly former chiefs of general staff, people with former speakers and that sort of thing. And it may be that that's an area where an option will, will have to be there for the question of compromise. I don't believe, though, that this round of reform will necessarily be the last word in the form. 
I don't think we should um, be so committed to achieving the last word that we risk sacrificing reform in principle. But for myself, I'm, I'm committed to 100%. The next question is, how are we going to um, bring it in? Uh, the long term, single long terms of office that are mentioned in the coalition agreement uh, envisage a, I, I suspect, a, a three, uh, a third, a third, a third set of elections, so that we would elect um, one third of the new number, uh, <coughs> first election, a third of the second election, a third of the third election, and then they would rotate much in the same way as uh, many councils do. Uh, if that happened, I suppose the simplest way to look at it is, is 15 year terms uh, with three. Uh, five yearly elections. That's all right. Uh, all right. That I suspect would work reasonably well, and it would enable the grandfathering of uh, current peers to take place over that period, with peers allowed to leave um, as they wished. And uh, unfortunately, peers tend to be at the older end of the scale, and some of them will, um, no doubt, pass away, and others will decide that they they wish to retire. So there's that, there's that possibility. Another area of a great importance to Liberal Democrats, but I think great importance generally, is how do we distinguish in the elections between elections for House of Commons and the House of Lords? Uh, there are two systems that are in contention, I suspect, for elections to the House of Lords. One is STB, uh, and the other is an open list system. Um, we, as a party, have always been massively in favor of STB. Uh, and I think for elections to the House of Commons, uh, that is undoubtedly the, the best system for us as a very long term at the moment. Um, please God, we will win the AB referendum. Uh, we will have uh, a system that is undoubtedly fairer, but the very fact that we call it yes, fairer votes doesn't mean that in 20 years we won't be looking for uh, a fully proportional system. But um, there are questions about um, STV for the House of Lords. Yeah. Some of those questions are, it is quite important, um, I think, for the functioning of the House of Lords and the supremacy of the House of Commons, that we don't try and impose on the House of Lords a tight constituency link. One of the values of um, the way that the House of Lords operates is that we, we don't have that casework, the tight constituency link, and the duties that go with it. Uh, and so one's looking at things on a slightly wider issue. Now it's noticeable in any of them. The Thursday debates on general issues that peers do tend to talk about the areas where they gain their experience of, of life and home and so forth. Um, the constituencies might therefore be regions, they might therefore be the Euro constituencies, but then again, they might be too big for satisfactory STV elections, which work, work best on four, five, and six um, members per constituency and no more. That rather depends on the number we choose. If there are going to be 450 roughly elected, which is the sort of higher end of the scale, 50-50-50, uh, um, it makes it a little difficult necessarily to, to go for the Euro constituencies. Uh, though it's, it's not too bad, but um, there are other arguments on uh, diversity. It may be that diversity, for which elections for House of Lords offer great opportunities uh, to have more women, more ethnic minority candidates, because the parties can um, select a, a broader list. And looking at things like flexible working, job share uh, in the House of Lords, which um, certainly women's groups are very keen on, and uh, there's no reason why, that, why the House of Lords shouldn't be a sort of um, Tryout round for more radical uh, ideas on diversity representation. So these options seem to me to be options for discussion. And I think the tactics of this, from the reformer's point of view, are to put these options in the open to make them the subject for discussion uh, and really not to um, allow the question to be do we reform or not, but how do we reform? Now, um, Philip, I think, takes a different view of the whole issue of reform of the House of Lords and doesn't, um, doesn't agree with what um, we, we are committed to. 
Um, seems to me, therefore, that because there is going, there is a, there are a lot of people who take Philip's view in the House of Lords, <laughs> uh, and uh, it seems to me, therefore, that we also have to look at the tactics of this. If it is the case that the House of Commons uh, is to be supreme and that the coalition agreement and the fact that there are three uh, party uh, manifesto commitments here um, is to be uh, weighed in the balance as I think it should be, as the overwhelming uh, um, consideration, it seems to me that um, we have got to make it clear, or the government has got to make it clear, that there is a willingness to use the provisions of the Parliament Act uh, to ensure that Lord's reform passes uh, through Parliament. Uh, and in that way, we therefore concentrate on the options where we say that everybody has, uh, has a right to talk. And I think I'm probably fairly close to my 15 minutes, so I shall leave it at that and take what we can open up to the Very good. Thank you very much. Very much for that. And before we move to questions, um, can I just ask Duncan Brack to say a few words? Thanks very much. Um, my role is to give the non commercial for the work of the history group itself. I suspect many of you in this room have heard this on several occasions every time you come to a history group meeting. But we are filming this uh, meeting for the first time and we're putting it, we're putting it up on the web. So hopefully this will reach a slightly larger wider audience. Um, the history group was founded when this party was founded back in 1988. And our role is to, our aim is to encourage research and discussion of the history of the party, the Liberal Democrats, and our predecessor parties, the Liberal Party and the SDP, both within this party, and all of you, and also in the wider kind of academic historical research community outside. And we do that in four main ways. One is through organising meetings such as this. And I can tell you that our next meeting, it's on the right leaflet on your chairs, um, is taking place two weeks tomorrow. It's a full day meeting, seminar, um, called Riding the Tiger. The first meeting we've ever organised with the title taken from a limerick uh, <laughs> is about the liberal experience of coalition governments. We thought it might be a good idea to look back at how the Liberal Party kept with coalitions uh, from the 1880s through to the Second World War and compare it to the current energy today. So it's a, a lineup of really good, um, high level academic speakers, uh, and you'll be able to come to that. Um, after that, we will be uh, hopefully organising a meeting in the summer in the National Liberal Club and another uh, French meeting at the next uh, autumn conference about the store planning of the Second thing we do is to publish the Journal of Liberal History, so quarterly. Uh, the last issue came out a couple of months ago, the next one's due out in just a few weeks' time, the issue number 70. Um, and I can tell you uh, the contents, we'll be publishing some of the papers from last year's seminar we did on John Stuart Mill. Um, and we've also got quite a long review of the two books that came out uh, a few months ago about the coalition negotiations. David Laws wrote one, uh, Rob Wilson, uh, Tory MP, wrote the other. Uh, reviews by David Howarth, and he's taken the opportunity to give his view of how the coalition negotiations ought to have proceeded. Quite <laughs> 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 an interesting read. <laughs> so those of you who aren't subscribers ought to subscribe and get that issue. Um, third thing we do is publish a range of other publications. Two of our books are still in print, uh, Great Little Speeches and Addiction of Little Thought. And all being well, if we stick to our deadlines, we'll have a new book out uh, in the autumn, A History of the Party, a complete history of the party, from the 17th century right up to uh, May of this year. Um, and that'll be, uh, we hope, the best, the most uh, complete, comprehensive, uh, short history available anyway. Um, and we also publish a few months of shorter pieces, a series of short booklets, there's a concise history of the party, everything about it in 24 pages, uh, and two booklets of biographies of leaders from the 20th century and 19th century. So the good place is to start if you're not sure or if you want some basic uh, background in liberal history. And then finally we organise a website with the addresses down at the bottom of this panel. Um, to join, all you need to do is pay us £20 uh, or £12.50, unlike, which is a remarkably good value. We also give you discounts of everything we publish and also of uh, usually liberal history books published by mainstream publishers. So if you join us and you buy everything we produce, you'll find you save more money than you just spent. <laughs> and you can find all this down in the exhibition stand. It's down in the bowels of the building, two levels down. So come and have a look at this there. And also for uh, people not at the conference, you can find more information about us on the website. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> right then, in that case, it's, uh, it's over to you. Um, relatively brief comments and questions, please, because otherwise you'll hog it for everybody else. So I'll, take, um, I'll take three in a row. Gentleman at the back. Gentlemen here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Patrick Smith. Yeah, Patrick Smith from Morton Stone. Uh, 
Um, my question is to do with the filibustering, obviously, uh, in the House of Lords, as it's described at the moment, in terms, you know, um, on the AB law, um, which obviously took you know, an arm and leg to get it through. Now, um, it also, uh, my question is linked to the Salisbury Convention. Now, obviously, the House of Lords, as it stands at the moment, cannot um, curtail or give a team um, contentious legislation. I mean, the government want, would want to propose and have, you know, debated and passed, but it was allowed to get away with it almost until, you know, in, in, during the dead of night, many people um, suffered sort of social inconveniences and so on. Now, if there is a new model at some future point, how will the, you know, A, the relationship B in, in terms of the Coxsolid Convention, and uh, B, um, <coughs> will, will it be necessary to pass another law um, because it will be more of a plenary house in forming the leader of the house, which will obviously be retitled because he doesn't have to be the House of Lords again, um, that he has or she has to pass government business. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, Duncan mentioned John Stuart Mill. <coughs> I don't sound a bit similar to Lord John Russell, the first muted life period is in about the 1880s. Now that liberals always well ahead of good ideas. As that had gone through, a lot of these hereditary peers wouldn't have been hereditary peers. It'd be interesting to find how many peers have been created since then. I mean, these gentlemen, Lloyd George and I gather grants who sold all these peerages, so it would have been likewise. So this problem would have sorted it out a lot. I mean, there may be pressure to change it come a lot earlier if there have been fewer hereditary peers there. But I totally, or maybe the last week in the party, I'm totally opposed to this. The reason? The problem in British democracy hasn't been the House of Lords, which does a good job of you know, getting everyone sits more civilised, but it's the whip system, the party machine system in the House of Commons that's mm -hmm. been the bugbear of British <coughs> democracy, not the House of Lords. That's what you've got to alter first. <coughs> I'm in favour of a totally unelected second chamber, an elected one, as other people said, be very quick with two things. It would be out of kilter with the majority in the House of Commons, and they would say we're being elected. Later, we represent the pump. <coughs> you would have the deadlock, would have central warehouse. Once it's elected, we cannot say it will we have it or more senior power in the House of Commons, that debate will come. I say leave well alone. Thank you. Uh, yes. 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 So, <coughs> my, my question is prompted by Jonathan's comment about um, the Lord Spiritual and the Chief Rabbi. Um, of course the Jews are not the only faith minority. And a lot of us here know that currently there are two Methodist ministers by chance amongst the political peers, uh, Leslie Griffiths and Roger Roberts. Uh, I like, I'm not sure there are more than that, but those are the two I know about. Um, could I ask both speakers to say how they would address the question of representing all faiths and all faith minorities in a reformed house? Okay, thank you. So that's three sort of very <coughs> different questions there. I mean, I think that the first one um, around filibuster it's all really goes to the heart of um, of how, well, whether and how the House of Lords is changed by virtue of having a coalition government, which I think is a, is a, a very hot topic at the moment. Um, the question of, uh, of life period is whether we should have reform at all. And then a very specific question about religious representation. Philip, i would just start with you if you want to pick out all of those. I I'll deal with all yeah. of them. I'll try and do it fairly quickly, because the first question encompasses actually rather a lot in, in terms of what is, what might be. Um, I mean, in terms of that particular filibuster, bear in mind it was very specific because it was dealing with a measure that was up against a timetable. Mm -hmm. um, that's what gave them some leverage because the time it had to be gotten through. So it wouldn't, some people say, oh, well, we've got a time to just, but then, you know, if they do it on this, they'll do it on other things. There's no point in doing other things because there's not the same time limit. So they wouldn't get anywhere. So that, that, that's an important point to, to bear in mind about that. And I think that. Um, militated against introducing a timetable, recognising that. Um, I mean, you've raised wider issues about the Salisbury Convention, because after you've got a new house, then there's no reason, as the Cunningham um, Committee on Conventions now, there's no reason why existing conventions would continue. And of course, there's no way you could ensure they 
continued, the new House could discard them because they are simply conventions. And there's no reason I can't see what the basis would be for maintaining the Salisbury Convention, given what I said about the, the whole premise underpinning uh, the 1911 Act. Um, so I don't think you could maintain that. Um, well, relating it then to the position of coalition and majorities, um, I mean, Labour keeps claiming because it's a coalition of Conservative and Lib Dems, and therefore numerically they're much greater than Labour, that somehow the government's got an inbuilt majority mm. of the Lords. And that was part of their reasoning on the parliamentary voting system and constituencies uh, bill. Um, but not on those occasions when they, the government was defeated on it. Yeah. Um, so um, they kept banging on, you know, the government's got an inbuilt majority. Over looking the fact up the Christmas recess, there were 31 votes and the government lost nine of them. Mm. Um, and indeed, it lost votes on the parliamentary voting system and constituencies bill, which is a bit difficult for them to keep maintaining the government. Mm can't be defeated, it's got an inbuilt majority. I mean, what's happened, I think, between the two parties, up until the, the end of last part, the swing vote was the Liberal Democrats in the House um, in terms of determining mm. issues. Now, that has now changed, because the, the, the cross-bench is always more numerous, mm. but not that good in attending. Um, to some extent, there's been a, a shift, I think, in the current part. The, the, the cross-benches are turning out in far greater numbers yes. than before. And if they divide disproportionately against the government, the government's in trouble. Mm. So the government still does have to work, as it did in the last Parliament, mm. to, to mm. get something through. Um, so I think that's an important point about the present situation. In terms of the second speaker, uh, who, who I spoke, uh, I thought spoke um, totally eminent sense. Um, <laughs> uh, and I've got a lecture here that will reinforce the point you made. Um, uh, the only point I would make about light is quite right. Um, and there was an attempt to create a light peer. Uh, uh, and indeed, statutory, we did the work at life, it's great, but they were the law lords. So yeah. they were the first example of yeah. people serving a particular period, so you'd already got the precedent set yeah. there, you could have done it uh, uh, yeah. sooner. And we could have, had, there was of course the prospect of reform before 1999. In 1968, the Parliament number two bill, and not because the lords objected to it, it fell into Commons because of that so called unholy alliance of Michael Foote and Enoch Powell. Yeah. Um, so uh, reform might have happened then otherwise. Now, coming on to the point about faith peers, it's a very interesting one. Because um, uh, not so much in terms of what might happen in a reformed house, because you wouldn't get the, any, I don't think, any prospect of that uh, so much unless you do have 20% appointed. Um, but everybody's assuming they're going to be the 20%, if you see what I mean. Because um, the crossbench think 20% must be independent of the crossbenchers. Mm, I wouldn't necessarily assume that. Uh, 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 at all, particularly when government starts to think where we're going to park our former cabinet ministers who have the commons and so on. Um, um, but on the issue of faith, I think there's an interesting point about the current house. And of course, the Wakem Commission tried to address this. Um, there is a problem, but it's not to do with the Lords in terms of our willingness to have peers drawn from a range of faiths. And that's what we've already got. So don't let the fact we've got the Lord spiritual mask the fact that we have members drawn from a whole range of faiths. Um, it's extraordinarily diverse. So, I mean, we've got more spiritual, we've got Church of England with peers uh, drawn from Church of England by, by reason of their uh, diocesan seniority. Um, but we've got Buddhists, Sikhs, Hindus, uh, Muslims, we've got a Farsi, Zoroastrian, um, and as well as members of no faith, there's quite a strong humanist group in the house as well. Uh, as was mentioned, we've got the chief rabbi in. Um, so, th there's a lot of members, and I mean, the main Christian face that are there, so you mentioned um, there's, um, on the cross benches as well, um, Baroness Richard of Callow, so um, a range of people drawn from different faiths, we've already got them, um, but if you try and do it on a more, if you like, systematic basis, the same as the Lord's spiritual, you've got a problem, but it's not our problem, it's the problem with the religions themselves, because of course, Church England is very straightforward, it's hierarchical, so you've mm. got the positions where you can translate them into the house. The, the other main faith which is the Roman Catholic uh, faith, but that's not the problem with the Lords, that's the Roman Catholic faith, because the priests are not allowed to serve by virtue of the Church itself. I and mean, there have been attempts, um, we were expecting uh, Cormac Murphy O'Connor to come in, and that was fairly well advanced, I understand, but I think something must have happened with the Catholic Church to prevent that, so it wasn't a problem, if you like, on our side. But if you think of the other religions, they, they don't have that same hierarchy, so you've only got the problem of how do you actually more systematically select them, um, do you have every year the, the president of the Methodist Conference? And, and if you want to bring in Quakers, <laughs> you know, what's the systematic, you know, how, how, what's the method by which you do it? Other than perhaps saying, well, look, you can nominate X number every year or X 
everything, it's something of that nature. That's, so it, it's that sort of problem. It, it's something as much with religions as it is, you know, on, on our side in, in wanting to bring them in. So I don't think there's a problem with um, the Lord's wanting to bring them in, because we're actually quite a diverse chamber, not just religiously, uh, in terms of religion, but in other respects as well. I mean, we've got more members of the common drawn from ethnic minority backgrounds, more disabled members, and so on. And, um, in terms of uh, the gender balance, since the Appointments Commission was created, about, it's about 50-50 in terms of the gender uh, appointments. That's actually one of the advantages of appointments, because you can actually change the composition, ensure diversity, uh, and do it very quickly. So, on the religious point, um, we, we are fairly diverse, but um, uh, doing that, as I said, on a more systematic basis, there are problems, but it reflects the nature of the religions, the way they're structured rather than any resistance on our part at all. Um, I mean, we benefit from the sheer diversity of our membership, and that includes those drawn from a wide range of uh, religions, as well as of none. Thank you. I'm going to concentrate on the filibustering question. <coughs> on the faith question, I have very little to add. I think that we could make a little more effort to um, formalise it, but I, I agree we are diverse. It's just that... At the moment, there is this enormous concentration on the church thing. I think we ought to make an effort to show that we're trying to get in other faiths. I won't answer the, um, the uh, all the pointed point because really I, I spoke about that earlier. The filibustering one was interesting. I, I entirely agree with Philip that the fact that they were up against a deadline uh, was an important fact. But I don't share Philip's optimism that it's not going to uh, happen again. Uh, I think there are a number of Labour peers have made it clear that on every constitutional bill they're actually going to do their damnedest to um, make trouble. And one way of making trouble is talking too much and putting down an awful lot of amendments and insisting that amendments be de-grouped and heard separately. That's why we have 200, 200, uh, 600, 630, 640, 650 MPs all debated separately and that sort of thing. Um, we did, in fact, uh, do something fairly unprecedented on two occasions during the course of the AV Bill, which was that there was a motion that the question be now put, which cut short debate, and that hadn't happened, I think, for 17 years, is that right? Oh, wrong bit, yeah. uh, and we passed two of those. The second one really quite quickly, and it was quite clear that the Labour Party were determined uh, to filibuster. Uh, my own view, and this is very much as a new boy, and I, uh, is that the, the reason the filibuster stopped was because it came, became quite clear that the coalition were prepared to uh, push through uh, some sort of programming motion, uh, and that the cross branches were moving our way on that, so that it looked as if the whole device of filibuster would become less useful, and it was the fear of that, I think, that that caused the filibuster to, to start to falter. Um, I feel that the business isn't necessarily run as efficiently as it might be in what is now a more combative house than I understand it was uh, before I came in. And we, we, we go from period to period <laughs> totally, totally non-combative in the sense that some, I don't mean I have anything to do with it, some of the debates are utterly... Um, courteous and gentle and everybody listens very carefully to each other, but on the more political issues, there is undoubtedly a feeling that some of the more recent arrivals, particularly from uh, the Commons on the Labour side, uh, have brought in a common development, which is going to need to be dealt with. And I think we may need to move towards um, the possibility of programming uh, debates more carefully, allowing amounts of time for particular amendments, limiting speeches a little more, uh, and I think also organising business through a business committee across the House, uh, rather than just through what are called the usual channels between um, the Coalition Whips and the, and the Labour. But I think it's, uh, it's very interesting in that sort of what sounds like a very sensible uh, way of managing business. I think, you know, we, we have to understand actually just how very difficult it would be to organise the House of Lords on, on those lines. And it would be an enormous change because, you know, one of the things that certainly when we were in opposition, uh, you know, the, the sort of tools that were open to us in terms of, of debate and so on, we held very closely the fact that government doesn't manage the business. 
in the House of Lords and that peers are free to debate at length and to keep, but the, I think there was always an understanding about where the lines were and I think the issue about what happened during the AV bill was that many peers, including on the Labour side, felt that the lines were crossed by a small group of people who didn't actually understand or care where the lines were. Yeah, and I think you've got a problem, I and mean, you're quite right, mm -hmm. but then if you start introducing time saving, if that then erodes the ability of members to raise genuine points. Because yes. mm -hmm. um, when the localism bill comes before us, I don't think mm -hmm. there's fear of a filibuster by Labour members, but there's a suspicion that a certain Lord Greaves may want to make his views <laughs> known, <laughs> um, which is not a filibuster, it's just that there are a number of issues he wishes to pursue quite legitimately. Mm -hmm. So it, it's getting that balance yes. right, and that's a real issue. Because I'm in favour. Um, of reform. I'm against an elected second chamber, I'm in favour of reform, because that's reform within. I think we do rather a good job. Mm -hmm. In terms of our procedures, I'm all for strengthening them, enabling them, and we do have a group at the moment about to report shortly on, on the working mm -hmm. practice of the House, uh, and I think that will come forward with what I understand, like some very good proposals. Mm. Good. Right, we'll have another, another set of three questions, I think. Yes, the lady at the front, and then... Um, Two uh, questions, quite short. Um, I understand that as we are part of the government, um, funding no longer uh, applies to us. Um, surely this is wrong because if, if anything, we need the funding for the researchers and the support staff even more so than, say, as opposition. Um, because you can't just rely on civil servants if you're a uh, uh, just because you may not be a, uh, one of the ministers. Um, the other question, the other point, um, there was a rumour when uh, the um, uh, cuts in uh, funding came out that one of the proposed cuts was the closure of the Supreme Court. Uh, this would mean the return of the, or the revival presumably, of the law lords um, where will they sit? What will happen to them? Um, I, the, there was some talk earlier, uh, uh, you, you mentioned in your, in, in your introduction that you were concerned that with electing about 150 peers in, uh, in one go that the Euro regions would be rather too large as constituencies. They'd be electing in the region of uh, 15 to 20 members at one go, which for anyone who's ever voted in the Federal Policy Committee election knows <laughs> that that's rather more than is easy to cast a vote for. And whilst I'm sure conference reps very carefully read a large number of manifestos and cast their votes, um, certainly I would not expect the general public to pay that much time and attention to an STV ballot with, which would probably have something in the region of 70 candidates on. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're going to have very small constituencies that are going to tie lords into constituency work. You could draw a perfectly reasonable constituency. It be, for example, uh, Kent and Sussex would be a reasonable constituency. The whole of London south of the river would be a reasonable sized constituency. So those would be six or seven lords. Those would not be constituencies that would tie a lord deeply into constituency work, and yet they would still be of a size where STV is practical and where we would get all the benefits that we already are aware of from the single transferable vote. So I think that concern is perhaps sometimes a little overblown. If you actually try working the numbers out, it's only about twice the number of MEPs we've got. Well, if you start by taking the number of MEPs for a region, double it, you can split most regions into two or three fairly straightforwardly without too much of a problem. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, I wondered in the history of this, when Mr. David Steele's bill, which was um, cross party and which seemed to have good interim things in it which would appeal simultaneously to the yeses and noes by moving towards an element of reform and yet preserving the house while he was in it. Um, <laughs> uh, which he said he, he fronted because he missed a meeting. Um, he um, on one budget day, I happened to meet him at a com Commonwealth thing, and he said he'd lost it. And then at the Liverpool conference, I was queuing to try and get into a very secure room, and Paul Tyler told me that the bill had been reintroduced. Mm -hmm. So please can we know 
what had happened to it. And the other thing that Paul Tyler said was, I asked him a question about the flooding of the House of Lords with new peers now. Why have they got the term limits on? Um, because some of them are much younger. Um, certainly the Democrats are putting people like Sarah Ludford, who actually wants out uh, because she's an MEP, and we can't do both. Um, it's apparently, it was apparently happening that the, it was thought that the legislation would be too complicated. I don't see why a term limit is complicated, it's a very easy thing. Okay, alright, thank you very much. There's a, a whole array of questions there about Cranbourne and short money. Closure of Supreme Court, which I have to say I've never heard no, of no, closure no. of the Supreme Court. Not, um, question about Euro region, stages of David Steele's bill, um, and then questions about time limits. I think I might sort of divvy those up. Um, Jonathan, do you want to start with Euro regions and um, size of yes. constituencies? I mean, broadly, I agree with everyone you said. If, if we were going to go for STV, and I think that's an open question, I think they're interesting arguments every, uh, either way, actually. Um, then I think half-size Euro constituencies are about right. I don't think you can do them in Euro constituencies, and you suggested about half in Euro constituencies. Between, a third, between half and a third, yeah, depending on, on the region. Like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think one other point about, about it is that STV uh, maybe uh, you know, the elections for the House of Lords may be the wrong way to give the electorate their first taste of STV if you later want that for the Commons. Uh, and also that there is some merit in preserving two distinct uh, systems of election. And if ultimately you think mm. STV for the House of Commons is right, it may be sensible to have a, a separate system for the House of Lords. Thank you. Um, this, yes, Can I deal with the others? Yes, start with the Steel Bill. It is cross party because I drafted it. So um, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a jolly good bill. Um, <laughs> um, um, I mean, but largely for reasons you, you, you mentioned, because our view is that it's, that would be both necessary and sufficient for reform, but others who may feel it's necessary but not sufficient. So what we're agreed on is it's necessary for making those changes. Because if reform's not going to come or if it's going to come, we ought to be doing something in the interim. As no, not, not, not a retirement, because we're against retirement age, because some of our best members are our oldest. And so um, we don't think there should be that sort of artificiality. There is provision for, for peers to retire, mm. and also for us to expel them as well, and mm. um, bring us into line with the Commons if they committed a criminal offence. Um, so um, uh, no, we, we didn't want to um, do it on, a, uh, as I say, on an artificial basis, because we might do some of our best members. We want to get lose those who aren't contributing much. So there was also a provision if you don't turn up, you're out mm -hmm. uh, as well. So it's doing it on that basis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as well as some of the others as well, we want to put the, stat the appointments commission on a statutory basis and hence protects the independence of the process and uh, its capacity to protect, if you like, the quality and the quality threshold. So um, the provisions are, yes, do garner across party support. Um, David's introduced each session um, so we get the issue debated and make the point, look, reform may or may not come, here's what we can do immediately, let's get this through. So that's why we keep doing it, to keep the issue to the fore and say, there are changes that we can all agree on, um, let, let's get on with it. So we decided we'd do that at this session as well, so it's been given its second reading, uh, in fact we we're contemplating trying to find time for having a day in committee so we can actually have more debate on uh, those provisions, because there's widespread support for provisions, there's just a, a small group of members who are against any change. Uh, 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 so that's uh, the problem, but that, that's the stage at the moment, so we're just waiting for uh, committee stage, and we have a um, getting some detail on on, on the bill. Um, I, I, do you want to comment on the short and Cranbourne? Yes, I do have yes, a view do. on that, yes. I mean, you're quite right, um, because the short, I mean, short money in the Commons, Cranbourne money in the, yeah. the Lords, goes to uh, the parties not in government to enable them to fulfil their parliamentary duties. Um, now, back in 2000, or, uh, I chaired the Conservative Party Commission to strengthen Parliament report in 2000. One of the things we looked at was money given to parties. One of the things um, uh, that I, I pushed for, and I think we agreed on, was that um, I argued I don't think that should necessarily be confined simply to opposition parties, because the distinction between government and the parliamentary party in government, and I think the parliamentary party 
in government mm -hmm. ought to have some provision to operate as a parliamentary party. Because mm -hmm. you, you're quite right, because as government, it's, there are provisions, but it's as government, it's not as a parliamentary party fulfilling parliamentary duties. So I've always argued that all parties represented in uh, uh, parliament ought to have some degree of support yeah. in fulfilling their parliamentary duties. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, I, I mean, it has also <coughs> struck me that um, it, it perhaps explains why parties in government over time become intensely managerial yeah. because their policy function is taken over absolutely. by civil servants yes. yeah, rather yes. than in, in terms absolutely. of generating. Yeah. Certainly yeah. one of the things yeah. that I was very exercised about last year when I was still president about making sure yeah. that our party retains independent political policy making that gets fed into, yeah. into parliamentarians. Mm. What well, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that it has put our... Uh, funding into particular difficulty because we don't, we aren't represented in all ministries. Uh, we have the necessity, and I think rightly, to keep our policy making very distinct, to keep our identity, and that's why we're all here in mm -hmm. Sheffield. Uh, and the fact that we were suddenly deprived of the money that we had independently in both houses has been really damaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and since then, we've committed to some set funding anyway. Uh, I think it's a, a great loss. Can I say, I uh, also don't believe there is any truth in any rumour that uh, the Supreme Court is going back to the House of Lords. I think it would be a constitutional um, regression uh, that would be profoundly to be removed for it at all, as far as I know.